Friends, in this video, we will talk about Genghis Khan's harem, which had 7,000 girls, how girls got into it, what happened to them, and a lot more interesting things. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and put a like to this video. Great Genghis Khan in 1206 united nomadic Asian tribes and created the Mongol Empire. The ruler formed a professional army and light cavalry. For 20 years of rule, the great Mongol Khan made conquest campaigns not only in nearby states, but also in the Caucasus and even in Eastern Europe. The Mongol Empire existed till 1368 and was the largest continental empire for all history of mankind. The echoes of history brought to contemporaries the features of the character of the great Khan. On the one hand, a harsh and tough commander, enslaver of countries and peoples. On the other hand, a man ahead of the era. He propagandized the laws of justice and did not consider women as second-class people. Genghis Khan, like any Eastern ruler of those times, had a huge harem. When invading foreign territories, all women were taken captive. The most beautiful ones were immediately sent to the Khan's harem. According to rough estimates, the number of girls exceeded 7,000. At that, the Khan officially had four wives. Concubines in such quantity gave status to the empire and decorated the court. Attention on the part of the emperor to all the girls was out of the question. During the feast after the victory, when the commanders of the Mongol conqueror were tearing and devouring huge chunks of almost raw horse meat, these women, one after another, appeared before the Lord as if in a beauty contest. He chose as his wife the most beautiful one who met his canons of female attractiveness. Small noses, rounded hips, long silky hair, red lips, and melodious voices. Khan personally decided which of the attractive girls would remain in the harem and which would become a gift. Not only a noble commander, but also any brave warrior and servant could receive a captive as a gift. Genghis Khan's wife could also pass from hand to hand. In this case, the ruler apologized to the woman for parting with her and explained his act by the fact that he gave it to a brave warrior who performed a feat on the battlefield. But a rather sad fate awaited the other girls. They were sent to the tents of his officers and they could become wives, concubines, maids, or they could just use them in lovemaking and then give them to the amusement of ordinary soldiers. King His Khan gladly slept with the wives and daughters of enemy leaders, and his army commanders considered him the owner of extraordinary sexual power, seeing how he every night sleeps with many women. This is a very ancient imperative. A chieftain must be sexually powerful and fertile, this is linked to the cult of the fertile earth needing fertilization. Genghis Khan apparently intuitively understood this and conformed. It is surprising that the great conqueror treated the women in his possession so delicately. He did not want the girl to take offense at him and passing her into the hands of others, showered her with all sorts of compliments. But the tolerant attitude to women did not extend to cheating concubines. Here the Khan was implacable. Genghis Khan realized that he could not provide male attention to all the concubines of the harem and that the girls are languishing and waiting. But the inviolability of the beauties was most important to him. Treason was punished immediately. Both the girl and her seducer were punished. The emperor took several wives and dozens of concubines with him on all his military campaigns. They were present at meetings with ambassadors, served at the table, pleased others with their beauty. It was very important for Genghis Khan to have beautiful persons with him. He treated them with great respect and at outsiders paid exclusive attention and care. In the retinue of the emperor even had an orchestra consisting of girls, which accompanied him on military campaigns. The subjects of the empire adopted the great Khan's respectful attitude towards wives and concubines and treated the women in their surroundings in the same way. Mongolian women, including concubines, had many rights and opportunities. Not only could they practice archery and horseback riding on an equal footing with men, but they could also fight in the army and participate in long military campaigns. Genghis Khan was not a particularly gracious victor. After he conquered a nation, he enjoyed kidnapping the wives of his enemies and either grooming or abusing them. In fact, in one of his most famous quotes, 
He spoke poetically about the joys after conquest. The greatest pleasure is to defeat your enemies, to take away their wealth, and to see those they care for in tears. Also, Khan often spent evenings with several women. In addition, he had no birth control, and he had a very large number of descendants. The disintegration of the old Russian state in the 12th century into separate principalities made our lands too easy prey for the Tatar Mongols. So lasted a couple of centuries, until in the XV century again occurred unification of Russian lands. But for this time, had time to suffer and get into slavery many Russian beauties. Conquerors' nomads not only charged high fees, but also took away the most valuable thing, beautiful Slavic women. With the invasion of the Tatar-Mongol yoke, women lost some of their rights. To be more exact, it was simply impossible to keep their rights and who would stand up for them. Slavic women were kidnapped and taken to the slave market, where they were willingly bought, and women were in greater demand than men labor force. The center of the slave trade was Theodosia. At that time, Kaffa. The market existed up to XV century, until Russia was united. The age of girls was from 8 to 24 years old, and in total about 7 million captives, 80% of whom were women, visited the market. Very young girls were taken away from their parents, and it was hard to find their daughter afterwards. Girls from noble families were often ransomed by relatives. Later, girls from rich families were kidnapped on purpose to get a ransom. However, if the girl was not only rich but also beautiful, the captor did not need any money and kept her. If a noble girl was ransomed after a while, it was not uncommon for her to return with a child. Well-to-do families took their daughters, sisters and wives far away. The closer to the inaccessible north, the less chance that their women would be taken captive. Once Khanbati, after a feast with Fyodor Yurevich, son of a Ryazan prince, as a sign of a treaty, asked Russian ambassadors to bring their wives and daughters to the Khan. It is not good for us, Christians, to lead to you, impious Tsar, their wives. When you defeat us, then you will own our wives. Russian husbands refused. Then Mongols have killed all Russian delegation and have ruined Ryzen in 1237. Fyodor's wife Eupraxia, in order not to be captured by Beatty, threw herself off the fortress wall. Russian girls were highly valued because of their looks. For the Tatar Mongols, it was exotic. They knew that in any case, they could profitably sell such goods. Slavic women worked in harems as servants. They treated them accordingly. If a Slav became one of the favorites of the Khan, she could allocate a servant herself. There is little information about women in the House of Khan and their way of life. It is known that the first senior wife of the Khan and his mother enjoyed great honor. Tatar Mongols perceived such women as their property. Sometimes they were taken to Egypt, Italy, or Central Asia. Our people and women have suffered a hard fate throughout history. Many aspects of the Tatar-Mongol yoke are not supported by modern historians and new researchers who believe that much of the story of that era is fictitious. Until their theory is officially confirmed, I rely only on classical textbooks and books. We can say that the 13th century Mongol Empire had a matriarchal system, and the freedom that women had at that time was not available in other states.